Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out at 10 a.m. on a Monday to hear us talk. So my name is Casey Hudetz, and I'm so excited to share with you a project I've been working on for about four years. And before we get into a wonderful discussion, I do need to have a bit of a setup, a bit of context. And to do that, I'm going to tell you a story. And like most stories that are about the power and limitations of AI, this one begins at a baby shower. So in the spring of 2017, my wife and I were expecting our first son. So some of our most attractive stock footage friends decided to throw us a party. At that party, someone gave us this book, I Want My Hat Back by John Clausen. Now, when I sat down to read it, I had no idea of its critical acclaim, nor what a cultural impact that it had. For example, fans had reimagined it as a claymation. My hat is gone. It had been remade into a video game. It was a 20-minute narrative film. It was a play, and it was even read by Gollum. My hat is gone. I want it back. It's been, it's been huge. I, I never would have guessed. Yeah. Now, for all the people that loved it, however, there were, it's, it did have its fair share of critics. The main issue that people were taking with it was the ending and perhaps the less savory implications of what the book was saying. GQ said it was the most subtle endorsement of murder you'll ever find. I didn't think it was when, we, when I wrote it. <laughs> so my son Henry was born and I could not wait to read him this book. But what I was really interested in is when would he understand that ending? And when would he know what happened to the rabbit? Now, if I did that right, you're wondering, what is this book and what happened at the ending? So to answer that question, our first panelist will be reading the book to you. Um, our first panelist is Pamela Pavlisak. She is a, a professor at the Pratt Institute, the author of the incredible book, Emotionally Intelligent Design. She's the founder of Change Sciences, uh, Change Sciences and Narrative Labs. So without further ado, Pamela Pavlisak. Okay, so we're gonna read the book. I'm just gonna hold up this first page because Casey has them over there. My hat is gone. Have you seen my hat? No, I haven't seen your hat. Okay, thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? No, I haven't seen any hats around here. Okay, thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? No, why are you asking me? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any hats anywhere. I would not steal a hat. Don't ask me any more questions. <laughs> okay, thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? I haven't seen anything all day. I've been trying to climb this rock. Would you like me to lift you on top of it? Yes, please. Have you seen my hat? I saw a hat once. It was blue and round. My hat doesn't look like that. Thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? Uh, what's a hat? Thank you anyway. Nobody has seen my hat. What if I never see it again? What if nobody ever finds it? My poor hat, I miss it so much. What's the matter? I have lost my hat and nobody has seen it. What does your hat look like? It is red and pointy and I have seen my hat. You, you stole my hat. I love my hat. <laughs> Excuse me, have you seen a rabbit wearing a hat? No, why are you asking me? I haven't seen him. I haven't seen any rabbits anywhere. I would not eat a rabbit. Don't ask me any more questions. Okay, thank you anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, Pamela, great job. <laughs> Very spirited leader. <laughs> So hopefully you understood that dark ending, the subtle endorsement of murder. But if not, I was able to catch up with the author and I asked him myself. Can you say unequivocally what happened to the rabbit? Can you just tell me? Because the ending is really... <laughs> <laughs> I remember when the reviews came out with the book that they had sort of talked about it being an ambiguous ending or a, almost a twist ending. And I never liked any of those terms because I thought we did it pretty straightforwardly. I didn't think we were making it up for debate. When kids ask me about that particular book, I say he ate him. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody got it. 
Um, so now um, I have this book. It doesn't explicitly say what happens, and it takes a bit of uh, logic to piece it together. So I started wondering, when would my son, Henry, understand it? So starting at six months, I just started asking him. What happened to the rabbit? What happened to the rabbit? Can you tell me? What happened to the rabbit? Then I kept asking him and asking him and asking him and seeing if I could catch that moment of realization on camera. Would he get it? Would he suddenly connect all the dots? So at the same time that I'm asking Henry, I'm also in my career reading more and more about AI and all the capabilities and all the possibilities and how it could be coming for my job as a product designer. And I started to get a bit concerned and thinking, okay, what can this AI actually do? So through the uh, design and tech community in Chicago, I was connected with our second speaker, Alex Kastrunis. He's the founder and CEO of the Y of AI. He is an, ins uh, an instructor at Northwestern um, MBA program, MBAI program, where he's created all the AI courses and teaches it. And he's the author of the wonderful AI for People and Business. So I asked Alex to an interview, but I didn't tell him what it was about. And again, this is the weird part. If it's okay, I'm just gonna read the book to you so you have a sense of it. It's very short, and then it'll help with the discussion, okay? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> In, in the machine learning and the AI space, could it currently understand that ending? And therein lies what we're going to be talking about today. So ultimately what I'm asking is could we take this book in some digital format, put it into some AI model, it comprehends it, we ask it what happened to the rabbit, and it could tell us the bear ate the rabbit. So this is what I've come to call the bear eats a rabbit or the bear test. And now, after all that context and story, let's get to the discussion. There are a lot of things that would need to happen in order for us to have our AI pass that bear test. Could the two of you walk us through these tasks and tell us how AI might address each of them? Sure. Um, so to pass the bear test, uh, it, for those of us familiar with AI and machine learning, we know that it all starts with data. Right? And we need data in certain types of forms. Um, so pixel data and images, normally with some of the computer vision techniques that are out there right now, you take images which are really just pixel data. Um, you create kind of vectors of numbers where these numbers represent the different colors of the pixels. So red, green, blue usually, RGB, and then a transparency number. And then you sort of unroll all these pixels in an image, create this giant vector of numbers, and that becomes some sort of rep data representation of an image. Likewise with text, which we have here in this book, two types of unstructured data. One is image data, right? The, the, the characters that you see throughout the book. And then we have the dialogue between the characters in sort of natural text um, type data. We also would need to convert that into some sort of data representation. And then we would need to have some way to feed both of those together, the, the image data and the language data, for every page into some sort of AI model that's either pre-trained or that we would need to train, and then be able to, at the end of that, ask this model, this AI system, what happened to the rabbit at the end. And in order for that model to answer that, ideally, in, in sort of what I would consider the ideal bear test, um, the model would have to be able to understand all the images in the book just as a human would see it. There's no annotation that says this is a bear, this is a snake, this is a turtle. Uh, it would also have to read all the, the text on every page and somehow figure out who's saying what, because again, the text isn't annotated either, um, and then put everything together um, and answer the question correctly. And one thing worth mentioning is there's a lot going on in this book beyond just images and text. It's often what you don't see or what's uh, not included and is not explicitly stated uh, that matters most. And with that, I'll pass yeah, it over to Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I come in because <laughs> my focus is on emotion and artificial intelligence that tries to understand emotion. And so I look at it from that perspective and um, I was a little more familiar with the book than Alex because I have three daughters. And so I had read the book before and I was familiar with it um, and thought about, well, okay, if we had 
um, some kind of emotion to help us with the meaning. And that's a lot of children's books are about working out your feelings, feeling okay about feeling your feelings, role playing your feelings. And so I thought, well, how could an AI approach this in this book? Probably not the facial expressions of the characters. That's one way that it normally works. And it codes up parts of your face. So your lips raised, A11. That means maybe that you're smiling, which means maybe that you're happy. They don't actually have mouths, so that creates a little bit of a problem. <laughs> and uh, there's not much expressiveness, although I found my favorite picture in here, which I should have turned to earlier. Let's see. Oh, here it is. This one's kind of expressive because you can see the body language, right? A lot of our communication, especially the emotional communication, is body language. So you see the eyes, you see the rabbit kind of leaning back, maybe a little bit anxious about what might happen in this situation. So, but I don't think it's going to get it from that. Then the other thing I thought of is like, OK, what about things that are symbolic of emotion, like the color red, for instance? A lot of times we have um, you know, different aesthetic qualities that remind us of an emotion or that symbolize an emotion. But red is really complicated because it can mean anger, it can mean energy, it can mean excited. In some cultures, it's angry. And there's been tons of color research. If you ever want to do like a Wikipedia deep dive on color and emotion, you'll be stuck there for weeks, I guarantee you. But sometimes it means anger. Sometimes it doesn't. And then for the AI to put that together, that red background of the page with the hat, it might make that connection instead of the emotional connection. So it's pretty, pretty unlikely at this point that it will detect any of the emotion in the text, which is really important. Although, Casey, you blew my mind right before the panel here because <laughs> you told me, oh, because I said, oh, should I read it in little voices like I normally do? And he's like, well, John Clausen told me that he meant it to be flat with no emotion. <laughs> and so I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> if, I, if I may, yeah. So I, I think a big task here would be initially just recognizing the characters, recognizing this is a bear, recognizing this is a rabbit, recognizing this is a hat, in order to be able to connect all the dots. Now, earlier, I'd, I'd taken these characters and I put them into the um, computer vision models for Google, for Microsoft, for Amazon, and they said it was a clock, they said it was a rug, they said it was a cone, <laughs> and there was no ability, based on those systems, to be able to connect what these things are. So already, there's, there's a problem, right? Can you help us understand object recognition and computer vision and how that might, how the newest models could play into this? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, these, th there's huge data sets of images out there, like ImageNet is a famous example, and there's a bunch of computer vision uh, models that have been pre-trained on this massive image data set. And those images tend to be labeled, meaning you know, if there's an image of a hot dog, for those of you that are Silicon Valley fans, hot dog, not hot dog, right? Um, great episode, but uh, you know it's labeled hot dog. Uh, if there's a cat, it's labeled cat, and so on and so forth. Um, and so you know you train these models. It's seen enough examples of different objects that had the label of what they were that it kind of learns how to map images, which again is just pixel data, right? Um, and patterns, essentially. They become pattern detectors. If they, they start to recognize like little cat ears and whiskers and you know, uh, cat features, uh, it sort of recognizes those patterns as being associated with that label or word cat. Um, the problem is, is that there's an infinite number of possibilities when it comes to images, right? Different objects can be rotated in certain ways. They can be scaled in and out. So sometimes they're very small in the image. Sometimes they're very big. Um, the lighting can be different, the contrast, the hue, um, all sorts of different things. And that's just with real you know, objects. So let's say these are pho photographs of like cars or cats or whatever. The minute you're talking, and already with all those different variations, but now if you're talking about doodles and drawings and different, like some with crayons and some with markers, some with pens, some with like <laughs> the illustrations here, um, you start to get into yet another sort of round of infinite variations. Um, and so these models really struggle to um, learn all the patterns across all these different variations 
of all these different objects. And so part of what we're seeing there on the image side only is that. Yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed that like the first time young kids can see this book, they know, they know that's a bear right, right there. They know it's a rabbit. My sons can see a drawing of a banana and an actual banana and a picture of a banana, and they know all those are the same things, but they haven't been so easily trained on it. I'm always amazed how, how simple it is for them, but what a complex task it actually is. So I'm going to come back to you, Pamela. Um, in your book, Emotionally Intelligent Design, you introduced me to the idea of emotion AI and yeah. the ability to read these emotions. You touched a bit on facial expressions. You touched a bit on body language. Can you tell us more about those and why yeah. and how they currently work and if they could yeah. be used at all? Well, I mean, if so, for instance, the play version of this um, book, probably they could work a little bit on it because what Emotion AI does is it detects um, expressiveness in your face or in your tone of voice or in your gestures. Um, some in your heart rate or if you have sweat on your skin. Um, there's like tons of interesting experiments about like teenagers sending each other romantic or sexy texts and then <laughs> measuring their sweat levels and stuff like that. Um, so, it, you know, but it's very rudimentary. It's like toddler level recognition of emotion. So if it's a really exaggerated face, a really exaggerated tone, it might get angry and it needs to make a few leaps, right? From the tone is very agitated and elevated to, okay, this means they're maybe like 50% angry and 20% excited, but we only see the probability that comes out the highest. Now, one thing Casey and I talked about with this is the text part of it, because there is emotion recognition that tries to understand the sentiment in text as well. And so you can see from the text in this, it is kind of flat. There aren't a lot of emotion words. But what happens in the text databases that are coded for emotion is they're looking at words that aren't just saying an emotion, although those work best, um, but have been flagged somehow through like supervised um, or directed learning to be emotional. So it could get it from that, and it could get it from expressive um, you know, lengthening of words like we do in text. So when we say, um, you know, hey, or we even do it in person now, it's kind of seeped over like on our Zoom calls, bye. Um, <laughs> right, while you're like groping for the end meeting button and maintaining your eye contact with the, with the webcam. Um, beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. Um, but in this book, there is all caps when um, he has sort of the realization and you have, and so like if you're a child and you see all caps, these letters just got bigger, even if you're not like texting, but who knows, three-year-olds probably they're <laughs> texting each other, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but even if you don't know that, you know the letters got bigger and you see the red and you see his eyes maybe widening a little bit or you, or you project that onto it, you can get it. But AI, so far isn't really trained on all the expressive ways we use language in text or in posts or online. It's trained in um, more kind of formal language. And that's a big shift that's happening in our culture right now. So I don't know what it could do with that. Yeah. So I, I, I like that you touched on sentiment analysis. And, and mm -hmm. I'm going to bring you in here, yeah. Alex, because yeah. I know you, you write extensively about it in your book. Yeah. And I know you've done work on it yourself. So if we were to look at just the, 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 uh, the story itself and just the words, do you feel like any sort of emotion, not from the images itself, but the words itself, could be, could be extracted in how the story works? Or just if you want to speak to story comprehension in general and what could be pulled out of it that way? Yeah, absolutely. So short answer is definitely. So for those of you not familiar with sentiment analysis, it's this area of artificial intelligence um, where you know, let's say you start with a bunch of text data and you pass it in, these models have been trained in advance to kind of figure out, you know, is the text overall positive? Is it neutral? Is it negative? Um, it can be more granular than that. It doesn't have to just be those three categories. So, you know, you can have a bunch of uh, other types of categories of sentiment. Uh, but essentially, you know, AI systems have been trained to do pretty well at doing that. So they, they could do it on a per sort of word or per sentence or per paragraph basis. So you can basically say, like, let's say all the red text on that page, um, you know, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a hat anywhere. I would not steal a hat. 
Um, because it has the word steel in it, for example, the model might somehow detect some amount of negativity mm -hmm. or something and classify this particular paragraph as being like 80% negative, you know, 20, you know, 10% neutral and 10% positive or something like that. Um, and that idea of sentiment analysis has been uh, extended to even audio data or image data or even vision data, like Pamela said, where um, you know, if somebody's talking, you can kind of detect, are they overall happy sounding or sad sounding uh, or something like that from the audio, as well as in images, you know, again, the face, facial uh, expressions and so on and so forth. Um, so it can be done on a text, purely a text basis. Mm -hmm. What about the repetition? That was something that struck me as I think if you were a kid having this book read to you or reading it and you saw this text here, and then at the very end, the bear says almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I'm not sure if it would get that or not, but to me that kind of stood out as a pattern because AI loves patterns and it's looking for patterns, yeah, that that yeah. might be a, um, a little something, a little hint? Well, it's, that's a great question because AI, so first of all, probably not for the most part because there's a lot going on in this text where, you know, the, the the rabbit here is acting kind of shady, right? And guilty and <laughs> things like that. And we kind of pick up on that. We're like, you're lying, first of all. Um, you you probably did steal the hat. And you're, you're sort of over answering the question that the bear asked. You know, you're talking a bit too much, which shows that you're maybe a little nervous, all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot going on here uh, that we humans can detect that AI um, isn't very good at, right? AI is not actually very good at common sense and reasoning and things like that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but what, what is interesting though, is AI with, when trained on enough data can pick up on some interesting things. So one example is, um, I don't know, again, going back to Silicon Valley, the show coincidentally, um, the guy that plays the CEO of that show um, is, the, it, it, did they, how many, show of hands, how many of you saw that AI uh, generated yeah, script and he acted it out. Okay. Yeah. So um, what they did is they, they did this test where they took, I forget how many, but tons and tons of screenplays and movie scripts from like all these sci-fi movies and uh, mainly sci-fi stuff uh, and fantasy movies, uh, I think from like the 80s and 90s. And then they had this AI auto-generate a script. And in the script for this new screenplay, uh, there the characters over and over keep saying things like, what's going on? I don't understand. What is this? What's happening? I don't get it. And the reason being is in sci-fi, in that particular genre of movies, you know, often characters are on these different planets and there's these different species of aliens and there's these different ships. Things are confusing. You know, you're trying to solve a mission or something. Um, and so in, in that way, the, the AI uh, model did sort of pick up on that certain themes more so of like confusion, lack of understanding, um, situational unawareness or whatever, however you want to talk about it. Um, but yeah, th this is a significantly difficult problem, this bear test, and we'll talk about that yeah. more here in a little so, bit. So I mean, Why? this might get, get picked up as confused instead of lying. And you know, emotion AI is yeah. really obsessed with lying as well and trying to detect liars. Paul Ekman, who, you know, has sort of the foundational theory behind the current state of emotional AI, has also developed what's called the facial action coding system that before it was encoded in machines was taught to like TSA agents and spies and stuff mm -hmm. like that to see if they could tell if people were lying or not. Um, short answer not so great at it. Mm -hmm. anyway probably people are a little bit better than the machines but there are some signals maybe that you that you hinted at here of talking too fast repeating yourself mm -hmm. um i don't know you can maybe the way it's read would impact it though so um so just a quick side note uh, facebook did something called the facebook hateful meme project where they mm -hmm. created an algorithm to, to comb comb the, the social media network and try to find memes that were perhaps bullying and then flagging them. And they would have for an example that it could not flag would be something like, um, your new skincare routine looks great and then it's a picture of a crocodile. Or here are all of your friends and then it's a desert. 
So, <laughs> so the, the computer couldn't connect or the AI couldn't connect that those two things together were saying something actually kind of hurtful. And for me, as a, as a layman, as I or read this playful. book. Or playful. Or playful, yeah. And for I me, as I, as I read this book, I, I have this screen up because I feel like, um, Alex, you're saying, like, um, how do you know you're lying? In this case, it, the, the system would have to see, say, I it would have to understand that the rabbit's talking. It says, I haven't seen any hats anywhere. And it has a hat on. So therefore, we know it, we have a lie. Yeah. So on this page, there's a lot required even just to understand what's actually being said. Um, could you could you talk more about that kind of multimodal inputs, how multiple things are put in, and then how sense can be made of them? Because I feel like, for me, it, it seems like that's a kind of a key to understanding all of this. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So multi like modality in AI, when people use the term modality, they're usually talking about the the type of data, whether it's audio data, image data, text data, that sort of thing. Um, today's AI mainly uh, uses one modality per model. So, you know, a computer vision model can detect objects and things like that in an image, uh, but it can't analyze text or understand text or do sentiment analysis of text. Likewise, you know, a model that works with text might be able to predict, you know, some, like as you're typing in your email client, I'm sure most of us have seen the auto prediction, auto completion, that's all AI driven. Um, that's all happening with AI that's trained on text. But that AI system cannot likewise detect objects and images. So these models um, are very specific to the modality that they were built for and trained for and optimized for. Now, that being said, we as humans, we can process and handle and understand and um, detect correlations and patterns and relationships between all modalities simultaneously. So we have eyes, we have ears, we have touch, we have smell, taste, all that. So we're collecting lots of data of different types at all times, naturally and seamlessly, uh, at a fast rate, basically. And we're sort of tying all these things together. And our understanding of the world around us is very comprehensive because we're able to put all these things together. Like, let's say we're driving in a car, we're going down the street, and all of a sudden we hear this loud car crash. We don't see it, but we hear it. Immediately, we might think to look towards the direction of it to see if we're in an immediate danger because we didn't see something, but we heard it, but we know that we need to now turn this other modality, our sight, to see what was going on. Uh, so we're able to detect these patterns. Now, to really solve the bear test, and to your point about multimodality, is that you know what you need to do is create an AI system that can read this book like a human does. So it has to be able to take both the text data and the image data at the very same time and understand both at the very same time and then answer the question at the end because it was able to understand all the sort of things going on with the text, including all the very complex um, you know, stuff that Pamela has been talking about, uh, as well as what's going on in the images. And by the way, going back to that sci-fi thing, um, one thing that's worth noting here is animals don't tend to walk around in forests naturally and speak to each other, and they don't tend to wear clothes like hats either. It's um, actually that's a really true. good that's children's true. book about that. So this, this, <laughs> this book also introduces some really interesting complexities in that um, it's not realistic in, in real life. In children's book land, it is, uh, but... You know, we've, well, we've probably not met too many talking turtles yeah. in the past. I think, but kids have, right? Because yeah. like that's, and that's the other layer. Yeah, so Alex point. was saying like, okay, we have all these sensory inputs. We have context through, we know a crash um, sound while we're driving might mean a car. So that's wider context. We also have this social and cultural and even subcultural context. And one of those is children's literature. Children have read lots of children's books and they know the convention that animals don't look realistic maybe in all the books and that they are um you know doing all kinds of crazy things that they don't normally in real life it's magical this is a perfect time i'm gonna pivot all right so now to throw a, a twist in the story everything we're talking about here was the focus of a short film that i made and i put out about a year and a half ago and after I finished the film, I thought, well, what do, what do other people think about it? Let me, let me put it out into the world. So I found this website called Metaculous. I don't know if any of you have been to it. But Metaculous is a place where you can post questions, and then the community votes on the probability of something happening, either if it will happen or when it might happen. So here are a few questions. 
This is one of the funnier ones I think that's being debated right now. Will George R. R. Martin die before the final book of Song of Ice and Fire? And the last I heard is he's still kicking. <laughs> still so so I, I posted my question to Metaculus, and for one glorious weekend, it was the most argued about and debated and voted upon topic that was on the site. And from there, it actually got onto Reddit and people were debating it. Someone put it in their Substack newsletter. A guy did a case study on it in his own blog. The author himself tweeted it out to his 75,000 followers. So it had this, this mini moment of virality that I was not expecting. But what's interesting is one Metaculus user named Devatech, what's up? he's anonymous, I don't know who he is. He decided to <laughs> take the book turned it into a text-only version, so we removed the whole object recognition challenge of it. He then put it into GPT-3, which is one of the, the large language models of the moment, very advanced AI that it's out there. And at the ending, he asked it, what happened to the rabbit? And it answered, the bear caught him and ate him. So this AI, by removing that one portion, was able to conclude <laughs> what happened at the end. I think we can agree, based on the bear test um, stipulations, that Devatech, who has no idea that he's in my presentation here, but Devatech did not pass the test because it missed the bigger image and, and language attribution portion of it. But that does pivot into the next big question I want to ask is, based on what we know, based on what we know, and based on what we've talked about, do either of you believe that the bear test can be solved today with the AI that we currently have? You go first. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, before diving into that, going back to the, the Devatech example, so the reason that was not, it, it's important to say why that wasn't uh, actually passing the bear test and then talk about whether it can be done today. The reason it wasn't passing the bear test is this person put into GPT-3 only the text. So already it didn't include a large part of the, mo again, the mod modality, the data that was, that us as humans, you know, if we open the book and we sit there and read it, we're taking into account everything that's happening in that book and that we see and read uh, by the time someone asks us, did the bear eat the rabbit, or uh, what happened to the rabbit? Um, so that wasn't the case in this, in this example, it was just the text. Secondly, the person um, annotated who was speaking yeah. in every line. Mm -hmm. So they said, bear, colon, you know, I want my hat back, uh, turtle, colon, blah, 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 whatever the words are. So with GPT-3, um, for those of you that may or may not be familiar with it, um, it's, it's a very uh, interesting type of AI system called a large language model um, that can do some quite impressive things. Uh, also falls woefully short too in a lot of ways on certain things uh, for sure. However, it, it is able to answer questions or summarize text or create you know, text and, and different things uh, with very little training beyond just the original training that was done, what they call pre-training. Um, and so one thing you could do when you uh, use it is you can either just ask it a question directly, that's called zero shot learning because you haven't given it any new data or examples, or you can ask it to do a certain task and provide examples. And, and this combination of things is what's called a prompt. So you're prompting GPT-3 on what you want it to do, and you're pro sometimes providing examples. That's called end-shot learning. And when you do that, you condition the model. You condition GPT-3 to understand the task that you're trying to solve. And that, that's, uh, it's called in-context learning or meta-learning. So in other words, GPT-3 is a model that learns how to learn. You're basically giving it the examples. By this person annotating the, the person that was speaking, this person also conditioned GPT-3 to have the, the names of the characters um, and the text that they're saying in a way that we don't have when we read the book because there's not, you know, we just kind of understand that naturally as humans. Um, now, as far as whether or not this can be done today, we need to really understand this concept of what's called benchmarks and baselines. In AI, to ever say whether or not something can be done, it typically all starts with, is there a benchmark for this problem? And a benchmark is simply a data set and a set of tasks that you're trying to do with that data set. So in this case, if there was a bear test benchmark, the bear test benchmark would have a way of feeding, a, it would be a data set, essentially a representation of this book in binary form of some sort, data form, that includes the image data and the text data. That's the data set that would be part of this benchmark. And then 
the task would be, and there might be more than one task. It might not just be only, you know, what happened, ask the question, what happened to the rabbit and then get an answer out. It could be, you know, what does that, you know, that one scene represent when the, that Pamela showed everyone where, you know, the bears look staring uh, the rabbit down directly and vice versa. Um, and then, so that combination of a data set and a task or tasks becomes what's known as a benchmark. And then very smart people out there, very smart AI researchers and teams, whether they're with academic institutions or companies like Meta and you know, Google and who, whoever else, then try and create these models to solve these benchmarks, to basically do the tasks and do them better than any other model. And there literally becomes leaderboards. So it's like a competition, there's leaderboards. And whoever's model sits at the top of the leaderboard is, then becomes known as a baseline. That's the baseline model that is the best at performing this particular task with this particular data set. So to answer the question of can the bear test be solved today, we would technically, we really need a, a, a benchmark for it and someone to establish a baseline model that actually passes the bear test with the right data um, in the way that humans kind of would ingest the text and the image data at the same time. Now, that being said, we can certainly um, say whether or not we think it could be passed, um, and I could certainly speak to that. But before I do, I just want to make sure, Pamela, did you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I guess my question is just sort of a bigger question. is like, well, okay, what is the bear test then? Is the bear test that um, it solves the ending? It, it did, but does that take away all the magic of the book and the emotional journey that you're on as you're reading it and the joy of figuring it out, or in the case of my daughters who are older now, never figuring it out <laughs> and never wanting to figure it out. In fact, when they heard about this whole docuseries, they're like, what? <laughs> and no, and they had to go back and read it because they didn't want to believe that, you know, they were thinking happy animals. So I, I think, maybe we have to think about how we want to define success, right? Is this book a problem to be solved? Is it something to be decoded? Or is there more to it than that, in that we want it all to work together? And that's, that's the joy in it. That's the discovery of it. So is it in the answer, or is it in the journey we took along the way? <laughs> and all the friends we made. <laughs> and all the friends we made. <laughs> And who didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> so about five minutes. And do you, do you want to wrap sure. up on like what you do yeah. you think this could be done? Sure. Got, yeah. Yeah. We'll go, go to the last question. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So going back to do I think this can be done. So um, the most state of the art stuff right now in multimodal machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's some pretty interesting stuff going on. Um, like uh, Google has something called Pathways. Uh, OpenAI has something called Perceiver IO. Meta has something called Data to Vec. And they're doing some really fascinating things with what they call transformer models uh, and an area of AI called uh, machine learning called sem um, self, su sorry, self supervised learning. So instead of having labeled data, you can just have tons and tons of data. Um, like in the case of GPT 3, it was trained on 46 terabytes of data that included something called Common Crawl, which is basically the, think of almost the entire internet and the data set. All these books, I forget how many, it might have been tens of thousands or millions, I don't know. Um, and then all of Wikipedia is in this data set, and then it's pre-trained on that. Um, so in terms of these self, and it's done in a self-supervised way. So basically just taking all this language data, you can kind of have these models that learn grammar rules, they learn how to disambiguate certain words, they learn like uh, relationships between different words and concepts. Um, also antonyms, synonyms, all that, all sort of automatically in a non-labeled, non-supervised way, which is pretty fascinating. So these other examples I just talked about um, are starting to look at how do you train one model so that you, you generate all these parameters, basically is how these models wind up. So GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters. So think of Y equals MX plus B, the equation of a straight line where M and B are the parameters. Uh, this, this model has 175 billion of those parameters that maps the input to the output. Um, now, they, they are making progress on these transformer models that 
can be trained on different modalities at the same time. And so you can pass audio into the same model or text into the same model or uh, images into the same model and it can handle it without needing to retrain the model or change the parameters. However, it still can only take one of those modalities at a time. So you can only pass language data and then get something out relative to the language. And you even have to tell the, the model that it's, it's text data or it's image data. Um, there's another area called um, QVA, which is, or VQA, which is visual question and answering. In this case, you can have an image um, and ask a question about the image and some AI can answer the question about the image just using image data. But again, it doesn't also have uh, language data that goes with it. Um, yeah, some of these same problems are true for the emotional bit. So let's say the bear test wasn't just finding the answer at the end of it, but instead trying to convey some of the emotional texture along the way or that journey. And the same problems hold true is that you only have one modality to work with. Usually that's something, you know, that's something that is being worked on. But also I think with Emotion AI, there's a bigger question of the theoretical foundation of it too, mm. because we, honestly do tell a little bit about emotion in each other through our physical expression, through the embodiment of it, that's important. But I think most people who are working in history, philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, and studying emotion would agree that that's not the whole story mm -hmm. and that it's, it's cultural, it's social, and those layers are really, really hard to capture because they're so dependent on the context of it, so it it is a long way off on that level. Could we just, in the interest of time, yep. it's 1042, yep. Yep. just, all right, so I'm going to ask you point blank. Do you believe, with our current tools, someone could do this? I don't believe that there's a model that can take that data. It, to have the text and the image data at the same time, you need this thing called joint embeddings. For those of you that might be familiar with natural language and embeddings, you would need joint embeddings. You would need probably a concept called co-attention. Um, these are all very cutting edge, state of the art, emerging sort of concepts in AI. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of work being done out there. There's a lot of research, um, but I don't believe that there's a model that could do that today. Um, there may be something that, that could, can do and spit out uh, an answer, mm -hmm. uh, but then the question also becomes, did it do that because it, it just got kind of lucky um, like, for example, in Wikipedia, the, the corpus, which is that large language data set I talked about that GPT-3 was trained on, it's probably come across in Wikipedia, in the books it, it learned from, in the internet stuff, this idea of bigger animals eating smaller animals. So it sort of has that kind of like understanding a little bit. So it might get lucky and make a guess based on something like that. but. It would certainly be more of just like a, a high probability guess more than even if it could be solved. And again, I don't believe there's a model that could do it like a human would do it with the joint uh, modalities at the same time today. I could be wrong. If anybody knows, let us know. So, um, so we got a no from you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. You, my long winded no, no. No, I just want to make sure we get to the last question because I'm most interested. And uh, what do you No think? and maybe you shouldn't even try. Okay. Ooh, let's get uh, to that next. That's a good one. All right, so I'm going to turn it to the audience. Do we have anyone in here? No, 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 not questions. Does anyone here think that this could be done today? After we've talked about it. No, all right. Oh, this guy does. we got to talk uh, to him later. Okay. Um, Interesting. Just get the next question. So the final question here, and one I think might be the most interesting for me, is when we, when we were able to do natural language understanding and processing, suddenly things like Siri and Alexa are possible. When we got really good at computer vision and object recognition, then autonomous cars could be more likely. So by, by, by kind of conquering one thing, more things were made possible. So what do we think? What will it mean when we can pass the bear test? What does it mean from consumer electronics? What does it mean for the state of AI generally? Well, one day when some program can take this and answer it, what else can be done then? And I'll, Pamela, so with you. <laughs> well, again, I mean, I think it depends on what we say is the answer. If it just solves the problem of the ending, um, then 
I think that's that's probably not too far off. But if it could go through and actually, you know, um, sort of take in everything, mm -hmm. and the question is like, what else could it do based yeah. on that? Well, I mean, I think part of the dream of AI is not so much that it could replace us or do things instead of us, but be a great way to augment and our intelligence and reflect back on ourselves. So if it could understand the um, emotional meaning behind the words and get a sense of that, well, that might translate to interfaces that feel more intuitive, that feel more respectful, mm -hmm. that feel more humane, um, you know, and keep some of that kind of magic of, of interaction. It's a long way off though, if yeah. that happens. <laughs> Alex, you have any thoughts? Yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll approach that two ways. One is, um, in some ways, we still don't know what the right answer is. Even though John Clausen said what the answer was, it wasn't in the book, and we had to, you know, Casey had to <laughs> hunt him down and get him to say that 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 the, the bear ate the rabbit, right? So, it, it, had that not happened, one could argue there really was no answer to the bear test or this this concept of passing it. But that being said, if if we could pass it, and if there is a way to understand that, I think what what makes that interesting is that it opens it, it it changes the dynamic a little bit more where ai has a bit more of a deeper understanding and comprehension of things as opposed to just a pure sort of like uh, probabilistic statistical mapper of inputs to outputs type thing without understanding all these sort of other things that we as humans might understand that are buried in the context contextual stuff like that, uh, or the things that aren't there, but we understand because we have common sense and things like that. Um, also, the ability to solve this and, and more than anything, be able to deal with the multiple modalities means that that could unlock opportunities to helping people with uh, disabilities, for example, like people, blind people, uh, people that don't have the uh, some of those uh, sensory mechanisms, um, is there a way to help with that, augment that in different ways? Um, it also could lead to more fair and uh, safer artificial intelligence as well, which is really important. Um, right now with some of these models, you know, they're, they're sort of indiscriminate, right? They're just like, they're little machines that you put something in and just spit something out. Uh, with no thought to it, it's just a calculator effectively. It's not, I'm oversimplifying, but um, but, you know, the, the closer you get to actually reasoning through things, understanding things, you know, being able to say at the end, hey, I, I could give different answers. I'm not sure. Even the ability to say I don't know the answer or maybe it's not a good idea for me to answer this in the first place. These are all things that humans do naturally, um, but machines and AI do not do at all uh, effectively, right? So, um, and as a result of the lack of that, you know, awareness and reasoning and logic and everything, you know, sometimes we do see those examples of unfair and biased AI and everything, because it just, it spits out whatever it was trained on. And if that's including the data, that's what it learned kind of thing. Yeah. Can I give you the last word? Yeah, I was just gonna say, and to answer the big question that I think is on everyone's mind, is this gonna help parents who have to read this 10 times in a <laughs> row every night as a favorite book? Maybe if the AI got good enough not to just reveal the ending and say, like, I want my hat back. Well, you know the ending of this. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's going to wreck it. You know, part of it is the magic and understanding storytelling and understanding that um, connection making moment that stories can be between parents and kids. And so if we could get a little closer to that without, you know, reinventing it or, yeah. or usurping that relationship it might be might be a better better situation all right well let me do a quick closing and then i think we'll have a few minutes for questions the the, the whole project this thing i've been working on it it comes from just a desire to understand all this godlike technology we have and all these breakthroughs and all this news we have through perhaps a more accessible lens. So whenever I read about news of what the new language model can do or what computer vision can do, having this book in mind and this bear test for me is a helpful way to frame it. And hopefully you, when you either go out and learn about AI or you read this book yourself, 
um, it helps you frame it too. And I know you are all wondering how Henry is doing. So this is our most recent question, and let's see how he does. What happened to the rat? Um, I don't know. Hmm. Don't ask me any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so a big, a big thank you to Alex and Pamela for giving us their insight. I think we've got about five, nine minutes left. Um, so if anyone wants to hang around and ask questions, and I'll start with you right here. Um, just really quickly, you mentioned uh, text and images. Yeah. But one thing I noticed was that when the bear found out that he saw the hat, it was, it was red. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I think um, how we squared it is I don't think it can do it because it's too ambiguous of a signal. Even though we as humans have an easy time saying, okay, there's red on the page, there's red in the hat. We know some the symbolic nature of red or have some sense of it. Um, that's a lot that AI hasn't been trained on yet, basically, and doesn't know. So we take for granted that we can do some of that, even if it's a little ambiguous and there isn't like a one right answer to that either. Um, AI can't do that yet. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry I didn't see the line there. Yeah, do you want to go, sir? Uh, yeah. yeah, first, thank you so much. This is exactly the kind of thing I come to South by Four. So, <laughs> awesome job. Yes. Um, <laughs> it occurs to me that this works on a lot of levels because the bear is having a multi multimodal problem, right? Mm -hmm. yes. If he could put it together that the hat was on the rabbit, he would solve it, but he was just taking in the text. Mm. So has it ever occurred to you that the bear is the AI and the humans <laughs> are the rabbit? And I'll sit down and wait, wait, say again, the bear is the AI. The bear is the AI who doesn't get it yet, and the human could be the rabbit telling it, no, no, no don't focus on multiple things, just focus on what I'm saying, <laughs> and that eventually we might be in trouble. I, well, that yeah, reminds I, me of I the gorilla. Oh, thing. I was just going to say, that reminds me of the gorilla test. So I don't know if you know that in psychology, where um, the researchers asked people to focus on how many times the ball is being passed back and forth. And there's a dude in a gorilla suit walking through. And the majority of people don't notice the dude in the gorilla suit. Now you all will and it's wrecked for you because I told you but cool. um, <laughs> it's kind of like that the focus is just on the one thing. So instead of like the whole context around can I say something really quickly? Yeah. yeah. I have to say, I love how serious everyone's taking such a silly question <laughs> that I put forward. So thank you, all, everyone, for being here. All right, Alex, sorry. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret. When he read the book to me in that interview, he showed a video, I actually didn't know what happened to the rabbit at the end. <laughs> but here's why, interestingly. Yeah. In the part where the bear goes up to the rabbit and asks if he's seen his hat, and he says, no, I haven't seen the hat. I would not steal a hat. The rabbit's wearing his hat, right? And to me, the fact that the bear doesn't recognize his own hat and he's looking right at it is an immediate, oh, well, that's not his hat. Clearly, that could, yeah, like, they that, got it at, like, going that already old ruled Navy it out for or me. Something, right? There was multiple. Exactly. So at the end, I was like, I have no idea what happened to the rabbit. <laughs> I, I, what's going on here? <laughs> kind of like the sci-fi thing. But, but to your point, that's, that's very interesting because it, it could highlight the, uh, the inability of the, rabbit, the bear to seemingly notice things that should be obvious to uh, people and things to, like that. Yep. To the gentleman who thinks it can be passed today, I got it. Yes. Uh, no, I just like being a contrarian. But <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry if it's a little bit rambly, but my question is on motivation and if that's mm -hmm. something broached by AI. And I ask because I was fascinated by how humans collectively came to like the, the realization that, you know, the probable motivation for the bear is murder in this case. Mm -hmm. um, when it, there was nothing explicit, like the, we didn't see him mauling the rabbit or plopping it in its mouth. Um, and I just think, you know, in fantasy land and in, in children's book, it's very possible the rabbit could have just teleported to the moon or something silly. <laughs> um, but nice. we have this like sort of inherent understanding that it probably murdered the rabbit. And so yeah. I'm kind of wondering if the divide between children not being able to get it is they don't have that pretext of like the darker side of, of humanity. Mm. And yeah. that's, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, I, I mean, that's such a good point because I think that's true. We have a different kind of mindset that we go into when we're reading a children's book um, or fairy tales have kind of that same property where they can be dark 
but it's also magical. And so we want to believe something else and believe everything is possible. And that's kind of the larger ethos behind a lot of children's literature is to make kids feel like the world is magical and anything's possible and they can try out a lot of things and be a lot of different things. And so to train AI to know that and, and you know, I, I don't know if we can do that. Alex mentioned that, you know, it could, it could know that, oh, um, bears eat rabbits. <laughs> yeah, and actually, just real quick on that, I didn't do uh, the plant example earlier, so this is actually a good good time for this. So just let's do a, a simpler version of the bear test real quick, a thought experiment, everybody in the room. Imagine a picture of, and it's a hand-drawn, like a cartoon or something, of a person in their living room watering a plant, right? A green plant. And there's other plants in the room. And let's say there's a, one line of text that says, uh, I love my plants. That's it. Just one image, one text. This book has 30 pages with images and text. But we're going to talk one image, one text. So one could then ask, why does this person love plants, right? Why do they love their plants? Well, we, because we have that common sense, and to your point, we have that context of things like concepts of murder, and we've seen movies and thrillers and all this stuff. You know, we might say, we might reason, well, you know, uh, they like the color green. They like natural objects in a room full of non-natural, man-made objects. They like to feng shui it up. They like that it generates oxygen, more oxygen in the room. They like that, um, you know, it's, it, uh, and uh, makes plants them feel are, good about themselves. yeah, makes them feel good. Plants are marvels of, you know, biology. They can turn sunlight into energy and all this, right? Um, and to, to do that, none of that's in the picture and none of that's in the text, I love plants, right? But we know we can answer that in a way that AI can't. And we can even go a step further. What if we said, well, why did that person choose those specific plants? Well, we might say, well, because they wanted something low maintenance. They didn't want to water it all the time. Or they don't have much natural sunlight in the room, so they needed something that's good for that or maybe it's it, a it, gift from somebody maybe who it's, likes them. yeah or it fits well in a certain area yeah. um ai that it, there's no ai that has that level of comprehension or understanding or common sense and reasoning or even the ability to reason out these things just for this simple image of someone watering a plant much less you know an entire book like this yeah. um so it's 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 quite interesting now that being said that vqa thing i said earlier the visual question answering thing that which is very state of the art, by the way, could potentially answer the question, what color is the plant that is being watered? And it could say green. That's about it. And they wouldn't take into account the text, I love plants. So anyway, yes, we have, we have infinitely more uh, understanding of the world from our experience and everything else that machines don't have, so, to your point. So when Thank somebody you. says AI is going to take your job, be skeptical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think that's all the time we have. We're going to be around for the festival. There's more information online if you want it. Um, they encourage you to give reviews on here because it helps us if we want to come back. But thank you, everyone, for choosing to come here. There's so many things.